Good morning and welcome to the Qdabra Software weekly webinar. My name is Hilary Stupa and I am a developer with Qdabra Software. And today we are going to take a look at the Computer Vision API actions from Microsoft Flow. Um, so mainly what we're going to be discussing first off is provisioning your computer vision appy resource in azure um, don't let azure intimidate you this is all just very much click on click off kinds of things you're not going to uh, have anything here that's out of your depth it's definitely uh, within reach for all of us um, the other thing we're going to be looking at is how we then use our computer vision appy. There are flow actions we can use for this. Uh, you can use it to describe or tag images. You can use it to generate thumbnails. Uh, you can use it to provide image OCR. And look, there's always use cases that I haven't thought of. By now, you guys all know that I'm not the most uh, creative uh, thinker. I don't, I don't look at something and think, oh, I could use it for this, that, and the other. I tend to have a brain that's thoroughly stuck in the business realm. So when someone talks to me about OCR, the first thing I think of are things like receipts, you know, for my expense report and, and things of that nature. And I will tell you that this OCR uh, is uh, not usable for that sort of thing. However, if you have other types of documents that you just need read and the text sent, um, that it does better at. So we'll take a look at some of that output. And also we can recognize domain specific content. Um, so in terms of domain specific content, uh, right now the only domain specific models that are supported are celebrities and landmarks. Um, you know, uh, that's okay. That's what we've got for right now. Perhaps you have a use case for that. I don't, but it's still kind of fun. Um, one thing I'd like to note is if it's, you know, 2023 and you're watching this on YouTube, all of this will have changed and, and that's a feature, uh, not a bug. So all of these things are changing all the time. Um, and in fact, even by 2020, I would guess that maybe things aren't going to work exactly like this. But uh, we've run into that a lot with these power platform features where uh, there's just, they're so dynamic right now. There's so much going on. So you have to go ahead and put on your inspector gadget hat and just dig in there a little bit and if the UI doesn't look exactly like what you expect or something doesn't behave exactly like you expect, you need to be willing to go look at the documentation and, and kind of figure out the right way to go. Okay, so that's just sort of a, a heads up on that. Keep that in mind. Okay, so the first thing we have to do here is provision the appy in the Azure portal. Now, I'm going to demo as I go along with this. Sometimes I like to, to wait until the end to show you things. Um, in this case, I think it's a little easier if we just kind of take a look as we go. So if we go look at our Azure portal right now and we want to uh, provision a new resource for this, we would go to create a resource. I'm not actually going to complete creating because I've already got one. Right now you'll see this under AI and machine learning and it's under featured. But note that there's a search bar right here. So you know, if you don't see it here, it's okay. Just search for it. We're looking for computer vision, okay? And so we create it. We enter a name. Uh, we go ahead and we enter our uh, correct subscription. Um, we enter our location. Look, I generally am going to use whatever's closest to me. Uh, in terms of pricing tier, you can see that I can't create another F0. We're going to look at the pricing tiers here as soon as we get to the, the next the next slide. Um, they only let you create one of those. Um, and then you can select a resource group. If you are not familiar with resource groups, uh, they're just a way of grouping together items. So let's pretend that you have a bunch of things in Azure that you're using together for a particular feature, functionality, or application. By using a resource group to group those together, you then have kind of a logical group that you can go look at to see all of these things together. Okay, so that's kind of all you've got to do to create it. It does some thinking about things and then, and I'm going to tell this, this is okay. It does some thinking about things and then it gets your, it gets your appy created. Um, so here is my, my appy right here. Let's take a look at uh, the pricing. So 
As far as pricing goes, F0 is your free option. 20 calls per minute. So you can make 20 calls to your appy per minute, 5,000 calls per month. Now, if you start hitting the limits and you need to change this, you can then change it to S1 later. S1 is the paid option. 10 transactions per second, and the cost depends on the transaction type. So back here, I've got the pricing up, and this is the pricing specifically for computer vision. So when you when you get into your cognitive services pricing, you can select the, the type that you're interested in, uh, your region, and your currency, okay? And then we start looking at, here's our free, and now we start looking at this, and this is transactions per second. So if you just were interested in tagging, um, it's a dollar per 1,000 transactions for your first, you know, zero to one million transactions. Um, and then I, I am assuming this is per month. Um, and then we come down to OCR, or uh, let's say you need to make sure that you're checking that no one is uploading adult content. Um, you know, you can you can use this. Um, and again, you can see we've got a slightly different uh, different cost level. Um, it depends on how many you're using and it depends on what type. Okay, so if you're not using free, uh, check out the, the pricing options here for S1, um, but know that you can, can change from free to S1 if needed, okay? Now, if we are using free, and we've got 5K calls per month and 20 calls per minute, what's going to happen in our flow if we hit uh, one of these limits, okay? Or even if we're using the paid option, what happens if we hit this limit of 10 transactions per second? You've built something that's just getting used hot and heavy, right? And it's actually hitting this, this transaction limit. Um, what you'll see back in flow is you'll get an AR429 with the message rate limit is exceeded, try again in five seconds, okay? And this is the actual detailed error message if you weren't looking at the, the body down here. Um, the good news is with flow, we can go ahead and we can work around uh, something like that if we so chose um, using our settings on our flow action. The retry policy in flow, the default retry policy uh, for certain HTTP status codes, you can see it right down here in the retry. Woo! <laughs> I'm so good with PowerPoint. You can see it right down here in the retry policy what the default is, an exponential interval set to retry four times. But you can change this to fixed or to your own exponential interval. Um, and so to do that, it's not, uh, I'm not gonna call it hidden, it's not um, super obvious if you haven't been poking around. So let's just go take a look at that real quick. And it's under settings. So under your flow action, a lot of them have settings and under them you can set a retry policy. So we could go to fixed interval. And we could say we wanna retry it 10 times. You can see it goes up to 90 and we can enter our interval. The interval is in ISO 8601 format. Now the other day when I clicked that it wouldn't close, but today it does. Okay, so you need to know uh, what that format format is. This is PT20S. This is 20 second retry interval is their example. Okay. Um, I included in the slides a link to this SAS documentation. And the reason I included a link to this documentation is because it was what I found that made the most sense to me in terms of these ISO 8601 uh, intervals. So P indicates that the duration is specified by the number of years, months, blah, blah, blah. T indicates that a time value follows. So when we say P, we're saying we're going to have a duration and it's going to be specified by T, which is a time value. And then we had 20 and then we had a capital S, which indicates the seconds are, are, are what we're seeing here. So you could do, you know, um, you could do five seconds, for example. Um, so this is just to kind of help you get a sense of, of what you can use there because it wasn't, um, I'd not used ISO 8601 durations before. Um, I'm used to dealing with ISO times, but I hadn't used the durations before. So I needed some help there. Okay. Um, so that's how you could change your interval to, to work around, uh, to work around this type of thing. So here's what's available to us. We've got analyze image, describe image, describe image content, uh, describe image URL. These three are very similar. We'll take a look at, at how they're similar and how they're different. Uh, well, 
they're not very different. Uh, we've got detect objects, generate thumbnail, get area of interest. We've got our OCR, uh, recognize domain specific content, and then image tagging. So this is what all is available to us. If we go take a look at our documentation, I think everybody is aware that um, that I don't have a, uh, a computer science background. I, you know, I've made that clear over the years as we've as we've gone through these webinars. Um, my background is uh, in English literature. That's that's what I went to school for. Very helpful. Um, <laughs> and and what I found in uh, learning my way. Um, in technology was that the one tipping point for me was understanding how to read and understand documentation. And so some of these Microsoft docs, I know if you don't have a development background, they can feel intimidating or like you can't understand them, but I wanna assure you, you can. Uh, you just need to read through them repeatedly. You know, for me, it was a matter of reading things again and again until until I started to understand how documentation was written or or what it meant. You know, it's like I understand all the words, but I don't know what they mean in that order. Um, use patience and, and perseverance and all of this documentation will begin to open itself up to you. And then that opens doors for you in terms of what you can develop and what you can do. Um, so I've got a link to this in the slide deck, and it has um, the outline of all of these different uh, all of these different actions. And so if we go take a look at analyze image, for example, um, we can see that it's got these particular parameters of language, image source, and image. Uh, you can either include the images as a URL or you can include it as content. Um, and then it returns a body of analyzed response. So if we go down here to the body, we can see these are the things it returns. Okay, so it returns an analyzed response. Some of the others return a describe response. Um, you can see OCR text response. So you can see all of these things here in the documentation, including the JSON path. OK, so these things are helpful to you as you try working with these actions and flow and you want to better understand the inputs and outputs. And just just make sure that you um, are aware of the documentation and that you come back to it as needed. So the first thing we have to do when we want to use this, like anything in flow, is we have to set up a connection. And when we set up our connection, the connection name is name it whatever you want, okay? Um, and the account key is going to be found in Azure. We'll go take a look at that. And then we've got the site URL. Um, so let's go take a look at my existing connection because I'm a little, I'm a little worried I might be lying to you about one thing. Um, so let me open a new tab and let's pop open flow again. I can't remember if I used uh, the actual, you might need to use the actual name of the connection in Azure. And that's the one piece I'm questioning myself about. Boy, I am determined to go to the wrong place here. Let me find connections. There we go. Now I'm in the right place. It's nice to know that everybody fumbles around here looking for things, right? And so here's my, okay. So I did name my connection the same thing as the uh, connection in Azure. So um, I am not confident whether this name has to be the same as what you named your connection in Azure, but it's my guess that it maybe does need to be. Um, however, the URL that goes in the connection, if we edit it, let's go back here. Sorry about this. It's been a little bit since I looked at this. I created the connection all of two weeks ago. All right. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be the same name because we've got the site URL right there. Okay, my bad. So if we go and we look at our computer vision API here, if we go to the overview, we can see that we've got an endpoint right here. So you will copy that endpoint when you create your connection and then that endpoint goes in the site URL, okay? And then back here at our API again, we need our keys and those are listed here under resource management. You can use either one of these two keys, doesn't matter which one. Uh, note the regenerate key button. If you regenerate your key, 
you'll have to go change the key in your connection. Okay, so just keep that in mind, um, that if you do decide to regenerate keys for some reason, you've got some some renegade flow doing something you don't want it to do, um, you could always regenerate the keys to knock it. Uh, so, so that's just something to keep in mind. But you can also update this if you need to, put in a new key and then save. So that is what the connection looks like. Now, if we, uh, go to take a look at these actual actions. Um, I've got all of these in a flow and I will package up, I'll export this flow and I will package it up uh, with, the, with the webinar slides. It's, um, it's nothing beautiful, but it will just have, it has each of these actions in it. So you can see these are the, these are the outputs that come to us from Analyze Image. Analyze Image is, I would say it's the most complete out of the uh, out of the various um, actions that take a look at images for you. So if we go back and take a look at the flow, um, I am going to go ahead and dump a few things in a folder here so we get this started running. Um, so let me just drop a few different things. I've got some text, I've got some celebrities, let's get a landmark. Now mind you, some of these flows are probably going to fail because I'm, I'm uploading a lot of things at once, so I'm probably gonna exceed my calls, so I'm gonna hold off now for a second and let it go ahead and finish uploading those and handling them. Okay, so um, I went ahead and I put my file content in a compose step, and, and that kind of minimizes the amount of things that are specific to my SharePoint site. That way everything downstream can just refer to this output from this file content step. Not necessary, um, just something that I did. Um, you can see here, remember when we looked at the documentation and it said we've got a source for our image and then we can select also a language. So you can choose a different language here. Um, it's, it apparently defaults to uh, English, but I'm sure there's other languages supported you can see in the dropdown. Um, so that's pretty much all of our options. You could change this to uh, image URL instead of image content for this particular one in Analyze Image. And that kind of that kind of covers it in terms of what the output looks like. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at our our flow here, and we'll take a look at one that has uh, succeeded. So we've got a few that are running, um, and so what's going on here is that these guys are probably hitting the 429 air and they're retrying. Um, so some will succeed, some won't. Um, but this one did succeed, it ran first, and, and this is just what I've been seeing when I upload a bunch of images, and it, it has to do with that limit. So here's what we get back. So I uploaded an image, and this one must have been one of my text ones, and this has the captions of a screenshot of text. Uh, it's got 82% uh, confidence in that, and the only tag it came back with was text. If we go take a look at one that I ran, here's another one that succeeded. That's nice that they are succeeding because I uh, didn't do as I say and I didn't set up uh, intervals on all of these in terms of the fixed interval retries. So here's one. Um, this one has text of a clock tower in the background with Statue of Liberty in the background. I, you know, I'm, I'm opening this picture. I'm not confident that I really see. I don't think that's so great because I don't really see a clock tower in the background. It's just the Statue of Liberty. But hey, you know, it does return that it's uh, only 38.9% confident in that. And here's the various tags we get, you know, outdoor game building clock. I'm not sure where it's getting clock. Um, <laughs> at any rate, that's our analyze image. If we go back to take a look at our flow, the next three describe image describe image content, and I dumped describe image URL. Um, they are all very similar. So if we take a look at describe image, the output is body captions, etc. If we look at describe image content, we've got the same things, body captions, etc. And if we look at describe image URL, Again, very same things. Um, the big difference is, is describe image URL takes a URL. Uh, describe image content takes an image itself. And I believe describe image takes uh, either. You can see with describe image, we can change this. Um, so I 
I cannot speak to why there are three things that do pretty much the same thing. I'm sure there's a very good reason. Uh, detect objects um, has a bounding box. Um, so it detects objects within an image and lets you know what the rectangular frame is for the object of interest. And so if we take a look again at our flow that ran for our Statue of Liberty, and we go run down here and we take a look at detect objects, you can see it gives us back a rectangle that lets us know where the person is, okay? So um, again, this is the kind of thing that I'm sure has a very valid use case. Uh, I haven't done a lot of image analysis. I haven't worked with projects that required it. So I am not sure what that use case is. Doesn't mean there isn't one. We also have generate thumbnail and get area of interest. So the output for both of those, the thumbnail, it kicks out a thumbnail image. That I could see some usefulness for. You have uh, libraries, for example, where users are uploading lots of large photos um, and you need to have those available to you in a thumbnail format. Well, I mean, if it was a photo library in SharePoint, I guess SharePoint would generate that for you. However, I, you know, there, there, I could see circumstances where generating a thumbnail could be useful. And Git area of interest has an area of interest. Again, it's a bounding box that lets you know kind of where the area of interest in the image is. So if we look here at generate thumbnail, Eh, not so interesting, you know, we've got the content that comes in. We can tell it the width and the height that we want for our thumbnail. Um, there's also an option of uh, smart cropping, I believe, here. If we go look at our advanced options, yes, we've got a smart cropping option. Um, this can also take a URL, so a lot of these will accept a URL instead of content, just worth knowing. Um, and then get area of interest also takes either content or a URL. So if we take a look at these guys, we already saw for our thumbnail, we get a thumbnail, and I'll go show you that in the library. And then get area of interest, we've got this, an area of interest. And I'm curious if this is close to our uh, bounding box or not. And it's 95, 33, 160, it's not. So our area of interest is slightly different from that. Again, that's one of those things that I'm guessing uh, people who are um, more image savvy than I am or have to do things like this within their work are going to find a more valuable use for than I can personally say. Um, as far as OCR goes, um, we can either output to JSON or to text. Now, I know one of the things that I uploaded was a, and we're going to look at the thumbnail again in just a second because I've got those being output to another library, but let's go see if we can find one of um, the receipts that I uploaded. I think that first one that succeeded was text. So let's go take a look at that. So here's an OCR to JSON. Okay, so we've got a bounding box and here's our words. All right, so here are the words from JSON. And as you can see, we have one word uh, per, <laughs> we have one word per returned object in our array, right? Um, in these different bounding boxes. So, um, again, I have questions about how useful I'm going to find this particular OCR functionality. And then down here, now this, returning it to text, this I could see uh, possibly if you are dealing with a screenshot of a block of text, a picture of a block of text, I could see that this OCR to text uh, could have a valid use case. Um, I could see translating it to text and dumping it into another column in a SharePoint library. I could see uh, translating it to text and emailing it to someone. I know one of these guys that we uploaded was also a receipt. Um, and I'm going to see if we can figure out which one that one was. We'll try this guy and see what we've got. Yeah, it looks like we got some, some words there. Okay, so this was a receipt. Now, I did not find this. I think it was this receipt. 
Let's take a look at it. Yes, it's this receipt. So here we've got a receipt. And again, this is the kind of this is the kind of use case that that spurs my imagination, right? This is what's interesting to me because I want to be able to take a photograph of my receipt and have my expense report filled in for me. And I am not going to get that from this particular functionality because you can see here is my receipt and and here is what, you know, here is what I've got back. And I can't reassociate line items with dollar values here, right? And if we look at the JSON response, um, man, you know, I don't, I don't know how one would pick through this, especially given that different retailers are going to be, uh, different retailers are going to have different formats in their receipts, right? So that was the, that was the part of the OCR that I found um, a little disappointing because to me OCR is interesting uh, if we're talking about business process, right? And and I wasn't seeing a good business process there. Um, domain specific content output. So this is actually kind of fun. Um, it'll recognize celebrities or landmarks, and I found that uh, both of those features worked pretty well. I think my Statue of Liberty was that one, so maybe my other celebrities were, well, we're just going to pick one and see. Um, so I've got both, um, you know, domain-specific content, one for celebrities and one for landmarks here oh look it knew it knew about the statue of liberty and you can see its confidence is really high on this one so that one was my statue of liberty hey note the retries and you can see the little the little yellow check up here it says hey i succeeded but man i really worked at that uh, and that was again because we were hitting those limits on my free subscription model so i'm guessing then if that one was my statue of liberty i think that one was a receipt that one was text mm. I can't remember which of these four I've clicked on now. I'm guessing one of these is going to be my celebrity. All right, and so here is my celebrities. Um, I don't know these names, but it's very com it's very confident that we've got Lisa Marie Presley in there and somebody by the name of Riley. And you can see we're very very confident in both of those. Um, so those things are are they seem to work well. And I would assume that the domain specific content. Uh, area will increase. You can also write custom classifiers. There's a custom vision appy and you can create your own classifiers. Uh, and there are some links in the slides to documentation on that as well. Image tagging. So this is one that I actually found of interest. And you'll notice that the tags are something that are generated both in analyze image um, and it has its own specific uh, action of tagging image, which is um, just doing tagging, doesn't also return things like categorization. So if we take a look at our tag image, we can see what tags get generated. Um, this was our, this was our uh, celebrity again, and you can see we're getting tags here with a confidence score. Um, so when we use the tag appy, we get a tag confidence score. I think that, do we get a tag confidence score in analyze response? We do. Okay, so in analyze response, we also get a tag confidence score with our tag name. Um, in the, uh, uh, the describe response, we just get tag names, we get description tags. So you can see here what you've got that's simplified um, tag names here from just description tags where you can have a collection back. Um, and then down here you can see we also have it with the confidence score from analyze response. So these are the various, and here's the tag response. So you can see with tagging, uh, everything is an object. We've got a tag object with a confidence score and name. So I actually found in terms of dealing with the data, I found analyze response and describe response a little simpler to deal with because I just have this collection of tag names and I can go ahead and just join those in an action in my flow. So if we go and take a look at my flow down here, I've got a variable for categories because categories are an object, and in order to get anything interesting out of them, I have to loop through them, and for each category, I have to go and get the category name. Okay, so the, the object category has the category name, and I can't just join those. Um, same thing with captions, same thing with celebrity names, same thing with landmark names. But because of the simpler structure with some of the tags, here I was able to just use join 
on the analyze image tag names. I'm going to go ahead and I need to move my controls again. So you can see if we go across here, we've got analyze image. We're looking at the description and we're looking at the tags. And that correlates with right here. You can see description.tags, okay? So when we did description.tags, we got back our collection of tag names. We didn't have to do any looping of another object array in order to get those. For example, we didn't have to loop through tags and join and get our tag names and then join those. So keep kind of an eye on these responses so you can get a sense of which objects might be slightly simpler for you to work with. Okay, so what I did here was I went ahead and I got some of this data together and then I, I dumped uh, thumbnails in another, uh, in another directory with this information. So you can see that this picture of, of Lisa Marie and Riley, um, there was some text in the background that got recognized and printed up here as well. Um, but we've got here are our tags and then we've got our caption. Um, here we've got text and receipt and a screenshot of text. Here we've got text and a screenshot of text. Categories, not as human readable as some of the other things. Um, and this caption is bad, but well, it had a 33% success on it. So you can see we've got uh, this additional information. And I think I've got landmark name and celebrity name as well. So those things are popping up over here. Um, here's my thumbnail. I think it's gonna be ugly. There it is, teeny tiny, almost not useful. So <laughs> that is that in terms of the Vision Appy. And I hope that um, I hope that there are some things that you can see that will be useful to you in these flow actions. Um, again, I, I think it has a lot of promise. I think the OCR I found uh, somewhat disappointing, but that's just because I, I seem to have only a business head and I lack a creative head. Um, but there's, there's a lot out there um, that you can probably use this for. And I definitely could see value in some of the things like generating thumbnails or getting a caption. Um, you can use this from Power Apps as well. I had bad luck trying to use the appy directly in Power Apps. Um, I was finding that not all of the parameters for the actions were exposed. So it may be simpler to just send your Power Apps data to Flow and have Flow process it rather than trying to use the appy directly in Power Apps. Um, so that's just kind of a heads up on that. At any rate, there's a whole bunch of other uh, recent and upcoming Power Platform features. Uh, the test framework is supposed to be coming out soon, um, so I'm keeping an eye on that. When we see when we see a release on the test framework, I'm definitely going to plan a webinar around Power Apps testing. There's a new AI builder. Uh, in Power Apps, and I think that's worth taking a look at. There's um, a new action coming for Flow for extracting structured data from HTML. Now that I'm I'm excited about. I think we'll we'll definitely take a look at that. There's something called Power Apps Portals coming up. And the other cool thing that I recently saw was Flow has a location trigger. So just think about that for a second. Uh, the one the one sample idea I saw on that was someone talking about how they wished Flow had a location trigger because what they wanted to do was they wanted it to clock them out when they walked out the door, right? How cool is that? I would like that. I, well, I don't really leave, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> if you are someone who leaves a building when you leave work, I think, I think a location trigger that can go manage to clock you out uh, would be pretty nice or record record what time you left even so that you've got you've got track of it for the next day. So at any rate, those are upcoming things. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip past the questions because we've had uh, we haven't had many attendees today. And you can always reach me at hillary.stupa at qdabra.com. If you do think of a question, if you do have a question outside of why does this no longer work the way you said it did, because we all know that's going to change. And I do want to tell you about Forms Viewer. Um, 
you know, Forms Viewer has been a huge investment on Qdabra's end. And the reason we're, we're so invested in Forms Viewer is because we know you have invested so deeply in your InfoPath forms. You built all of these amazing things. And yet with uh, InfoPath form services being deprecated and InfoPath being deprecated, now what? You know, it's great to try new tools and it's great to build your new stuff with the new tools, but you need to have a way to keep using your stuff that currently exists, that's in process and that's working well for your company. And Forms Viewer gives you the ability to do that. Uh, we just shipped uh, version 4.1. It's amazing. It's got great new features. Um, and you can also get Forms Viewer from the SharePoint store. So it's very convenient for you to use on your Office 365 SharePoint site. Um, if you want to install it on-prem, you can do that too. And it comes with the great Qdabra support. And you guys know we are always here for you. So at any rate, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the week and a fantastic weekend. I hope you get a chance to try out the Computer Vision appy. I think it's important that we all kind of keep an eye on these things that are coming up, even when we can't see an immediate use case. And I also want to mention that on August 8th, I'm doing a another flow webinar. This one's going to be on leveraging the graph appy. If you're not familiar with graph, you really should be. It's a one-stop shop for a wide variety of Office 365, Microsoft 365 appies. Um, and I want you to be aware of some of the things it does because it will give you even more power in your flows and in power apps. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.